I want to dive in this morning. We're going to continue this series. Hey, God, I have a question. Hey, God, I have a question. And I'm excited about this message. I believe it'll connect with us. And especially if you're maybe new, new to the Lord, new to Bay Chapel, or maybe you're in a season where, you know, honestly, you just feel dry in your relationship with God. And for some in the room, if you're being honest, you're here this morning because it's Sunday and this is what you're supposed to do. It's not really out of passion, it's just out of routine. Some of you, you're here this morning because you clicked accept to a volunteer opportunity and you knew I had to be here or else Ken's check-in wasn't gonna happen. You know, I mean, you're, you're here out of responsibility instead of out, out, out of a passion for God. And I'm praying today, God, restore our passion. The question we're going to answer this morning is how do I make a fresh start? How do I make a fresh start, a fresh start with God? Could we be honest this morning is that relationship sometimes can be really challenging. One of the things that I find can be so challenging with relationships is even the introduction to the relationship. Whether it's you're somebody you're meeting for the first time, somebody that you're reconnecting with that you haven't seen for a week or months. I notice this in people. I, I love people watching. I even see it on Sunday. Some of you, man, you are all about people. You walk in, op- you know, arms wide open. You want to just make sure you talk to everybody. Then there's other, others of you. You walk in and you try to stay as close as you can to that wall right there on the outside of that building. You have these blinders on. You want to make sure nobody sees you. I don't want to talk to the pastor. I just want to take a right right here. Get in. You get your notes. You come, come on now. Listen, I don't want to preach you in a conviction, but let's just be real about it, all right? And then there's the awkward tension that, and, and the interaction we feel when we go to shake hands with somebody. You know how when you've gone to shake hands with somebody, but you don't fully get your hand in there and you give them like the two-finger handshake? I mean, it's, just, it's weird. You go to shake hands with somebody only to realize that your, head, your hand is really sweaty and kind of clammy. And, you know, and then there's the people that give you the handshake, but they hold on for way too long. Like, bro, just let go, man. I mean, you're passing DNA. You're just holding on way too long. And then there's some people that, you know, and we do this a lot in church. You know, we're brothers and sisters of Christ. They'll walk, hey, bro, how's it going? And you go to get the handshake. But they want to leave it and give the handshake and then pull it in for the hug. And you're just not ready, man. I mean... And then there's some people, you know, they're, they're, no handshake at all. They're just going right in for the hug. And do I go full hug? Do I go side hug? Because side hugs are for friends, man. You know, and, and so there's this, this awkward tension. I was at Panera Bread meeting this guy. And uh, he, had, he wasn't there yet. So I was in line and I was just waiting to, to, to get my drink. And I saw somebody from church and so... I typically don't do this. I I was out of my shell for some reason on that particular day. I saw this lady. She's checking out. And I walked up to this lady. And I mean, as aggressive as I possibly could be. I reached my arm around, gave her the biggest pat on the back. I mean, just nestled up close to her. I said, hey, how's it going? And she looked up everybody. I had never seen this woman in my life. Oh, no, no, she didn't go to Bay Chapel. I was so embarrassed. As a matter of fact, I think I invited her to another church. I was like, go to St. James, man. Go to, you, you'll love it there. So embarrassed. We, we, we've all had something happen like that before, though. You know, have you had a situation where you thought, man, I am never, I'm never going to recover from that. I, I'm never going to recover from that. What if we could make a new start? That's, that's the question I have this morning. Well, what if we could make a new start in Jesus, experience the fresh grace, mercy, and love that he has for us? I want to talk about it for a few minutes this morning. If you grab your note sheets, we'll follow along together. I want to kick it off with a, a scripture that I use routinely. It's so important to the vision and culture of Bay Chapel, our house. John chapter 10, verse 10. I share it multiple times a year because I don't think I can pour this into our church why we exist enough. Jesus makes this statement that's so important to our lives, uh, understanding the freedom that he wants for us, understanding our purpose. Our purpose, if if you've never heard it, we exist as a church to help people find God and find life through relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe simply that the best life is a life surrendered to Jesus. In John 10, Jesus declares this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. 
But he doesn't stop there. He says this, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Have it to the full. Can I ask you today, if you just went and took inventory of your life right now, would you, would you describe the quality and experience of your life as the full life that Jesus has called you to? One to 10, one being I'm not even close, 10 being man, me and Jesus are tight. I mean, we're, we're so close. My relationship is intimate with him. I'm experiencing joy. I, I, I'm finding peace in God. Where are you at today? And, and if we're falling short of that, God help us to make a new start. Let me ask you this morning, has there been a decision in your life that you've made that you wish you could take back? Let me ask you, is there something that you've gone through that you feel like, you know what, I can never recover from that? I'm never going to get another chance. Maybe it was a tryout, a job interview, a relationship that you walked through that was so difficult, painful, or maybe it's the lack of freedom that you're experiencing in your life. I think so many times the enemy's goal is to kick us and to keep us down. But can I just say to you in faith today that failure isn't final. Failure isn't final. Whatever you're walking through, whatever you've gone through, let me tell you, Jesus still has great things for our life. But the goal of sin is to do everything. The goal of the enemy is to keep us down, to keep us distracted. Three things if you're taking notes. Number one, sin. The goal of sin in our life is to steal our joy. Steal our joy. And the way the enemy works so often in our life, he just creeps in. We don't see it coming. We're not prepared for it. We don't recognize the attack. It just shows up unannounced. Actually, it was like me this morning. I typically, my routine is to get up earlier and, and I'll take about a 20, 25 minute jog and I just spend some time praying while I'm jogging. Pray that God will keep me alive in that heat and humidity while I'm jogging. And then I pray for you. And I pray that God's spirit would move in an awesome way and that people wouldn't see me, but they'd see Jesus and their lives be changed. I mean, I tell you, this morning I was experiencing such joy, such, I mean, such time with God. I was on top of the New Tampa Bridge and I was just praying for our community and praying for our church. And I got home and everything was great. And I tell you, I, I, I walked back into my, our driveway and I reached my hand down to grab the door and I got about six inches away from our door handle when I saw on top of our door handle, everybody, a giant frog. Oh, Lord Jesus, let me tell you. I, I mean, I yelled as loud as I can. I screamed as loud as I can. Jen never came to rescue me, church. I mean, never. She, she didn't show up at all. I actually didn't know if I was going to make it back inside my house to get ready for a church. And I think, you know what? That's the way the enemy shows up in our life. It's unexpected. It's unannounced. Sin. He just creeps in. Shows up when we're not expecting, when we didn't see it coming. And he's doing everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's what David said when he recognized his own sin. He said this in Psalm 32. He said, the pain never let up, for your hand of conviction was heavy on my heart. My strength was sapped. My inner life dried up like a spiritual drought within my soul. But look what happens. Then I finally admitted to you all my sins, refusing to hide them any longer, and you forgave me. And you forgave me. He says, I, I came clean with you, God. I, I opened up about the issues of my life. You know, as I was thinking about this idea of just coming clean and, and giving all to God. I, and how we sometimes, we try to hide our sin. Feeling like that's the best way. It reminded me of when I was a kid. I don't know what your childhood was like. But I remember as a young kid, one of the things that my parents wanted so bad for me was to eat healthy and to, and to actually desire vegetables, which I hated. Some, some I did like, but there was this one particular vegetable that my mom made that, man, I'm telling you, I, it, it, it was awful. My mom loved to make stewed okra. Stewed okra. Now, hey, if you fry okra and give me some ranch dressing, I'm good. But see, amen. You know, you can amen that, shout that down. I mean, it, it's good when it's fried. Let me tell you, stewed okra, you can hardly chew it. And I mean, when it goes down, it just feels like it's sliding down your throat. Listen, go have some stewed okra today, man. Just try it again. Give it a second shot. 
I remember I would sit there at the table and my, my, I remember the guilt and shame. You know how your parents did when you wouldn't want to eat your vegetables and they'd remind you about all the other kids in other places of the world that didn't have anything to eat? That's what they would do to me. And I sat there and I just, you know, I'd pray and I, I, I wish that I was a magician. I could just abracadabra those vegetables away. I remember I'd call our, our dog, our Chinese pug, Bruno. Man, our dog Bruno didn't even like stewed okra, everybody. I mean, nobody wanted this stuff. As I think about those vegetables and how I would try to hide them and just get rid of them, put the napkin over them, pretend like they weren't there. I think so often that's the way sin is in our life. It's sitting there. We know about it. We know the pain that it's causing. And instead of actually doing anything with it and, and surrendering it to God, we just try to cover it up. Pretend like it's going to be okay, but we never experience the healing that God has for us. It, it, the Bible word is this, it's repent. Repent, you know what it means? Come clean with God. Do a 180. Let me ask you today, what in your life do you know you need to give to God to repent, to get right, to renew, to just go ahead and just say, God, I give it to you. The second thing is this, is sin promises pleasure, but it leaves us in pain. It promises pleasure, but it leaves us in pain. Let me tell the truth this morning. How we deal with the hurts in our life determine how we heal. How we deal with the sin in our life determines the freedom that we walk in. And I think there's five ways. It's not in your notes. We're going to write them down. Five ways that we deal with hurt. We deal with issues in our life. Number one, we medicate it. We medicate it. For some of you, that's, that's your out. Just, just some more food, just another drink, just another cigarette, just, just something in my life to help ease the pain, the, whatever I'm going through. For some of you, it's a relationship. You're using it to medicate the, the pain in your heart. For some of us, we deny it. We medicate it. We deny it. We pretend like it's not there. Number three, we project it. We project it. We turn our sin on other people. Now, man, this is so close to home for me because the issues of my life, the way I, I deal with them so often is I let it turn into anger and I start pointing fingers and look what other people are doing wrong. Number four, we turn it inward. We turn it inward. That's how we deal with the pain. It creates anxiety, depression, isolation in our life. Can I tell you one of the greatest ways to step out of that season of pain is to come clean with God about every area of your life. I repent. I get it right. Number five is the best way. We let God heal it. We let God heal it. And there's somebody in the room today that needs to make a decision that I don't want to stay where I'm at anymore. I'm not going to do it another day. I'm not going to live bound up by my shame and my sin. I'm going to walk free in Jesus' name. Number three, sin destroys our identity. It steals our joy, promises pleasure, but leaves us in pain, destroys our identity. But I love this truth from God's word this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Somebody needs to underline it. Somebody needs to put it on a note card this week. Be reminded of it every day that I am not who I used to be. I'm not what my parents said I was going to be. I'm not the pain of the divorce. I'm not bound up by my past, but I am free in Jesus' name. And I'm going to walk and I'm going to live in the freedom that he has for me. Come on, Bay Chapel. Can you give me an amen this morning? Amen. 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 How to make a new start. I'm glad you asked. Number one, we make a daily decision. We choose to die to our flesh. We choose to die to our flesh. Listen, it is so much easier to fix everybody else's problems, isn't it? it it's so much easier. I can identify uh, issues. I can identify my wife's issues. She's not in the service, so we could talk about them right now. She, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But here's what I realized. In order for me to experience everything that God has for me, it requires a change in me. And we just want everything else around us to change, but we don't want to change us. It requires me daily dying to my flesh. And the best way to say no to my flesh is to say yes to the fullness of God. 
Say yes to the fullness of God. The more I desire and the more I hunger after the things of God, the less I want the things of this world. I, I shared with you before, but a couple of years ago, I, I read this article. I think it came, came across my news feed on social media. And it was this enticing headline. It said this, eat more food to fight cravings. Yes, that's me. Yes, I, I, I mean, I... I definitely fell for the bait and I immediately clicked on that article. And I was expecting how to eat more Chick-fil-A to fight cravings. You know what I'm saying? How to stop more often at Dunkin' Donuts and, and you know, tell you where the fresh ones were. But, but you know, it didn't say that. It, it was a little bit of a, a, a clickbait header because it, it was all about eating fresh vegetables and, and, and fresh meat and things that are really good for you and how when you fill yourself up, with stuff that satisfies and stuff that sustains you, you have less desire for the things that leave you empty. Church, hear me today. I mean, you, you want to get out of the rut you're in. You want to get out of the routine. You want to get white hot for Jesus. I mean, stop filling yourself up with social media. Get out of the Facebook and get in the good book, all right? You know what I'm saying? Like get in something that can change your life. Jesus can change our lives. We say no to our flesh and yes to God. Here's what Paul says in Romans 8. He says, so dear brothers, you have no obligations whatever to your old sinful nature to do what it begs you to do. For if you keep on following it, you are lost and will perish. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, I love us, you crush it and its evil deeds, you shall live. I'm making a decision. Devil, you have no place in my life. I, I, I put you under my foot. I'm walking in freedom. Man, my, my, my relationships are going to be healed. My marriage is going to be strong. My relationship with my kids, we're going to pray together. We're going to seek God together. And, and, and as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Number two, we daily release, release our past and we pursue freedom. We daily release our past and we pursue freedom. We make a decision and we say this, I will no longer be defined by what I've done, but I will live free because of what Jesus has done for me. I'm no longer going to live defined by what I've done. And listen, I don't care if the sin was last night or if it was 10 years ago. Whatever it was, whatever pain, whatever shame you're dealing with, let's walk in freedom. I'm using Psalm 51 to just kind of pour into this thought because I... I connect with David in Psalm 51. It's one of the lowest moments of his life after he's had an affair with Bathsheba. The pain, the shame that he's feeling. And, and when I read Psalm 51, it resonates with me because I know how I feel when I've disappointed God and feel like, you know what, I, I don't even deserve to connect to come back to God. But he says this, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me. Wash me clean. Purify me from my sin. And I love, I don't have the whole chapter there, but you jump down to verse 12. Look what it says. And restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Make me willing to obey you. You, you, know, what, you know what David's saying? God, don't even, don't even just set me free from my sin, but give me a greater passion for serving and loving you. God, and don't let my issues in my past keep me from everything that you have for me. God, I release my past and I pursue freedom in Jesus' name. Number three, we daily pursue healthy relationships. Daily pursue healthy relationships. Let me, let me just encourage you, church. It's so much easier. It's so much easier to walk in and walk out on the weekend but not connect. But can I tell you, the strength of who you are and the strength of your relationship with God is also directly connected to your relationships with people. That's why we challenge you so much. And this week, we're kicking off our, our opening for, for connect groups. They'll be open for a week, and then we begin them next weekend. I just want to challenge you. Maybe that feels awkward for you. Maybe that's going to be a huge step of faith. Well, get in a group. Get in a group. Find a place to do life with other people. 
And if it's not a group, find a surf team, find a, find a place to make a difference in your life. Do something great for God. One of the groups that we're kicking off this semester, and there's so many great ones. You can see them on the app. You can see them in the note sheet that's in your worship guide. One of the things that we're excited about, and it's, it's a burden for me because I realize this, is there's, there's so many people that are brand new in their walk with God. We're kicking off a group called Group One. We, we've gone through several seasons of start where we're seeing new people come in. I mean, there's some of you, you're so brand new to God. You see the book of Job and you think it says job, man. You don't even know who that is. I mean, it's just everything. Everything is brand new. And so we want to create a group for people. Group one is for people that maybe you've never been to a group. Maybe you're new to Bay Chapel. Maybe you're new to your relationship with Christ. You want a stronger foundation in your walk with God. You know, who's this group for? It's for people that are hungry for God and to live out everything that he's called them to be. That's what all our groups are for, but particularly in this group, it's gonna give you a foundation to step and walk in your, growth, your relationship with God. It's discipleship, it's memorizing scripture, it's growing closer. But can I encourage you, whether it's group one, or whether you get in a couple's group that's diving deeper, or whether you get in a group that is all about family and relationship, whatever it is, and find a place to do life with other people. Is it going to be convenient? No. Could it change your life forever? Absolutely. I love what James 5 says. It says, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you can live together whole and healed. Whole and healed. God, help us to be a church that's just not punching our ticket, but we're passionate about God's kingdom, about caring for others' needs and living life together. Last thought this morning. Number four, we daily pursue God's plan for our life. We daily pursue God's plan for our life. Romans 12, 2. I want us as we close, I just want us to read it out loud together. Romans 12, 2. You see it on the screen. Let's read it. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Hang on just one second. I got about a third of you with me. Are you ready? Come on, like everybody out loud. You got this. Like you're going to cheer for the bucks this afternoon. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So good. Underline it. Let it sink in this week. Because there's no sweeter place in your life and in our life than knowing I'm in the will and the hand and the plan of God. I'm living out my calling. I'm not just grinding. I'm not just going to another day of work. I'm walking in everything that God has called me to be. God, help us to live that out. Experience your freedom. Love people. Love God and be everything you've called us to be. Why don't you just bow your heads as we close this morning?